Well, welcome to another episode of That Atheist Show. We have Bruce with us, with us again today. He Hello. Is, um, um, his last uh, travels brought him, I guess, to San Antonio and, and Washington, Washington D.C. D.C., yeah. So welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, you got back a little early. If you'd stayed another week, you could have stayed for the Reason Rally. Yes, I know. It's a, it's a shame that I didn't think to get that timed better. Although, although it's been kind of interesting because um, I, I was sort of very seriously thinking about going to that. Uh, there was the last one was in 2012, and uh, they had I, I don't know how many thousand people there. Mm -hmm. and it was a big event, and um, and it's out on the mall. Is that right, or is it? Uh, I'm, it's it's somewhat yeah. Through buildings or? It's most it's mostly outdoors. Okay. And uh, but it's a big presence trying to bring um, skeptics and humanists and all the rest to um, the uh, you know into Washington to do some lobbying and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But the problem that I'm seeing is that it appears as though the uh, third wave intersectional feminist social justice warriors have taken that or organization <laughs> also. <laughs> okay. So it looks like the same people that created the problems with Atheism Plus mm -hmm. are now doing um, you know, the, same, the same thing with the Reason Rally. Okay. And so if you look at the website, there's no secular atheist or humanist issues on there. They're, they talk about uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, uh, sexism and LGBTQ, you know, mm. whatever. Mm. Uh, Very special interests. Precisely. And so the other thing is it looks like the American Humanist Association has also been taken over. Mm -hmm. So that's an organization that did a huge amount of really good work that I think is done. Mm. I, I think it's, it's over. But um, the Reason Rally has, uh, you know, a series of rules about, um, you know, if any LGBT person, you know, tells you that, uh, you know, starts telling you their story, you're responsible to listen to it. Mm. And if you argue with anybody about religion, you know, which is what happened at the last one, there's huge amounts of YouTube video of, you know, people, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, what's his name? Hovind. Uh, can't tell. Eric Ho Eric uh, Hovind mm -hmm. was there, um, you know, <laughs> arguing with I guess Aaron Ra and uh, Thunderfoot. Uh, Thunderfoot is Phil Mason. Mm -hmm. um, about about religion. religion, and that would all that would all be prohibited. So um, the uh, Christians can come in and, and argue, but none of the people there are allowed to talk back. Oh, I see. You know, okay. it's that kind. It's that kind of restrictive stuff, and it's it's a shame because it had an opportunity to be a really good event, and I think it's been destroyed. But we will see. I guess it's going to be live streamed, um, and of course, the stuff will make its way up onto YouTube. So. And what's the format? How does it work? There's a podium, and people just share the yeah. podium. Or? Podium and tons of speakers. Okay. And so we do have some. Um, you know, scientific atheists. Mm -hmm. Bill Nye is going to be there. Um, I don't know about Richard Dawkins. He was originally supposed to go, but he had a stroke recently. Oh, he did. And yeah, uh, it's it was after he got deplatformed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had a little <coughs> problem with blood pressure, and mm -hmm. apparently flipped out a bit about having been deplatformed by the feminists for retweeting that uh, uh, video. There was a. Um, an animated video that had been done about the sort of similar behaviors between third wave feminism and, and Islamists. Oh, okay. And, I see. and he I haven't seen it. He, retweet, <laughs> re, he retweeted it and, um, uh, and got in trouble. All hell broke loose. Hmm. Yeah, they taught him a lesson big time. And so apparently it, uh, he, um, and in fact, the the event that he was supposed to, he, had, he was uh, pretty much the big draw for this, this event. Mm -hmm. And when they deplatformed him, um, and they, they didn't even send him a letter, they just, just like, you're deplatformed, you know, they just announced that he was not going to... Sort of like being defrocked. And something like that. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of this going on in the, um, in the social justice warrior movement, where people show up to talk and they get shouted down, and, you mm. know, there's violence on campus just right now on shutting speech down. 
uh, which I find to be enormously troubling. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, uh, uh, so he got, he got deplatformed, and uh, then <laughs> the morning that, uh, that he had the stroke on, he got a, a very nicely worded letter that said, uh, we're sorry, <laughs> we don't want, you know, you, you can come speak and we apologize and all the rest of it. Hmm. Because, of course, their attendance, I mean, people just <laughs> dropped out and oh, wanted a huge, you know, their, their attendance went because <laughs> it was, you know, social justice warriors have taken over. Mm -hmm. And so those events, people don't go to them anymore. They, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the stuff that Atheism Plus did and, you know, there's speakers up there and, and but if the camera ever pans back into the audience, you find the place is empty. Hmm. Um, because it's the, um, it's really sad. I mean, the whole social justice warrior thing is trying to take over the new atheist movement and hmm. has really interfered with it greatly. Hmm. So that's, that's the latest on, on what's going on this weekend. But I, you know, will very much be watching um, the video that comes out of it. I think a lot of the speakers are worth seeing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them have been added specifically to uh, whinge to complain to whatever about um, sexism and rape on campuses and all the rest of that stuff. And so it's the, mm. so social justice warriors doing their thing. Mm. Um, so I won't, you know, I probably w watch the so start in, of a few of them. So in your view, that's what that's doing is watering it down. Is that what you mean? Well, it's not it just was, watering it down; it's taking it over. Mm. It's completely co-opting it. The the implication is that what the what was this group supposed to be originally about? It's an atheist group, is that right? Precisely, yeah, it's a I skeptic see. group. Okay, a skeptics group, right? Mm -hmm. And so the the original intent was to talk about science and reason and bingo and that sort of thing. Richard Dawkins, um, Bill Nye, you know, people like that. Right. And a lot of those people, you know, instead of having more of them, uh, I think e Eugenie Scott is still on the speakers list. Mm -hmm. um, who's the person who? Uh, what is it? The Institute or something for? Um, Science teaching, right? And she was the one of the the people who really played a big part in a, in the Dover case um, against creation, against intelligence design, and right. repackaging of creationism. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's move on. We have a topic of um, in uh, God in man's image. So yeah. to start that off, I I pulled up a couple of slides. Good. Okay. So let's. Uh, I guess the first one I think is um, the S. What is it? S. See the Sistine Chapel. So yeah, if you could still put the first one up there, Matt. Um, okay, there we there have. We um, Mike, yeah, that's a classic. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Michelangelo and God. I mean, look at the arms on God. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's like Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of level. Yeah. You well, know? you would expect something like that. He's for, God, for God, after all. Yeah. I mean, he's God. Although a, Adam is no uh, slouch either. No, he's not. But God's got bigger biceps. Yeah. And so God is clearly working out a lot in the gym. Yep, absolutely. And well, he can have any kind of body he wants, yeah. presumably. So, but this is the kind of image that many people have of God, which is a you know white-haired, bearded mm -hmm. man with uh, bulging biceps, and uh, you know that's so we have a God in our image. Mm -hmm. So. And that makes sense, of course. When um, obviously this is that's a turnaround of the of the actual quote. The Bible tells us that God created man in His image, right. because presumably God existed before man did. But in fact, it's it's uh, it's much more reasonable to presume that man invented God. Mm -hmm. And what better form to invent God into than as a man, as a bodybuilder? And of course, it's got to be a great man. <laughs> Might as well make him a bodybuilder. Yeah. He probably has other. Endowments. I bet he's got large hands. Yes, unlike Donald Trump. <laughs> so, um, let's look at the next one. So we have an alternative view, which is the FSM one. Uh, so let's pull up that slide. And we have an alternative possibility, and that is the flying spaghetti monster. The flying spaghetti monster, yes, his noodleness. Yes, he's, uh, he's noodle, shown there. noodly appendage. And his two meatballs, yeah. and uh, you know the eyes at the top, but um, it's as reasonable as any other. Yeah. If you presume that God has a physical body, right. then there's no reason to presume that it that it evolved in the same way that ours did, mm -hmm. presumably. Yep. 
So just a not just a an alternative thought on that. <laughs> so so it's always been interesting to me the idea the if you kind of play out the scenario, mm -hmm. if God has a physical body, right, um, then presumably it existed mm -hmm. um, well before the earth was created as described in Genesis, right, which means that it didn't really have any place to live, right. and it didn't really have any air to breathe or any light with which to see or anything like that. Is that a reasonable I would think assumption? so. And although, although because in the beginning it was void. Well, it was void, but the, the darkness was on the face of the deep. Yes. So we did have water at that point. Okay, deep means water. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. as, as, I, as I understand that. Yes. Okay. So when the Bible says that God created man in his image, right. we've always assumed that meant our body matched his body. Yep. Is there an alternate interpretation that is extant in, in Christian religion? I don't think so. That's what it means to them. As far as I know. I mean, you're mm -hmm. as much of a Christian as I was. <laughs> well, I guess that's true. I mean, that's the way they, um, that's the kind of thing they imply yeah, exactly. when they describe in his image. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that would explain a great deal. God is very anthropomorphic in the mm -hmm. Bible. He, for example, Just experiences... Just like Bugs Bunny. Yes, that's right. He experiences emotions. Yes. Especially he, he experiences a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. And um, as we all know, you can't really experience emotion if you don't have a body. Emotion plays out well, in the theater well, of the body. I mean, why can't spirits be uh, angry? Well, the, you don't have any adrenaline. You don't have any of the other chemicals. The physical feeling of being angry is primarily a physiological state. I see. You could imagine anger in a, in a, a brain in a jar, I suppose, yeah. but it's hard to imagine that anger becoming very intense. Well, I mean, couldn't you know? God have created all this? Hi, you're on the show. What's your name? John. <laughs> Welcome back, John. Hi, hey, John. You know that uh, that second slide? Yeah. Uh, could those two things on each side of the tentacles be gonads? They could. They it's probably entirely are. possible. Yeah. Because if God can have big biceps, then he can also have big meatballs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, that, it just struck me, struck me that uh, with no explanation of that, that that's probably a, a representation of gonads. But that does kind of and beg God's, the, God's the question. Big ones. Yep. It does beg the question, doesn't it, John, though? If, the, if there is no Mrs. God, then what good do those do him? Well, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, he, presumably, uh, he if he had before he gave man a woman, no, I guess he did anyway. If he had had that and he had had a Mrs. God, it would have been a lot easier for him to create man, yeah, wouldn't well, it? Well, not only that, but you know, um, he was pretty lonely. I mean, God hanging around with no Mrs. Especially with big gonads. Yes, really. <laughs> yep. It's, I mean, you'd think the first thing he'd do <laughs> with that kind of loneliness in play would be uh, to uh, eliminate those. Yeah, but I mean, well, if God... Well, created himself a, a female God. Yeah. He could have, but instead he, he created a bunch of human beings. Yeah, but... Yeah, he created a man, and, and we assume from all the literature that God was a he, yep. and yet he created a man. I think if I was God, and I was the only being there, I'd create me a woman. Well... That's, that's, I think, a good idea. But then, you know, if he had done that, he might not have been interested in creating the rest of the universe. That's a good point. History would have played out very differently. Very differently. Yeah, we wouldn't even yeah. be here. Yeah, then we wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have to have this show anymore because nobody would have anything to believe anyway. Well, the other thing is we wouldn't even be here to have this show. That's, yeah. right. that's the whole point. I mean, if God was busy, you know, dating, and you, you wonder how long that all lasts. You know, and he's God, so, you know, he could be, he could be in love forever. Well, but the fact that he didn't have a female or created himself a female uh, might have something to do with all the uh, the uh, sexual uh, repression that throughout the ages that's gone on. So. Certainly, it would explain a lot. Yeah. But not in a theistic notion. It would. It, it explains a lot if you presume that human beings are the ones that created God, rather than the other way well, around. Then it all makes I, sense. I don't assume that. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> I see. So, yeah, there's no other way to look at it. I yep, mean, that's true. There's just nothing uh, like your, your 
show starts out with, there's just nothing to, to prove that there ever was a God until man invented him. Yep. Yep, so, I think that's probably a pretty solid conclusion. Yep, I don't see how, actually I don't see how anybody with a 10th grade education can, can be uh, a believer. Well, I, I started having problems with that with a second grade education. <laughs> as, as did I. Yeah. You know, which was, you know, I, I began, the whole thing was this perfect body thing. I've talked about this on the show before. But, you know, extending beyond that sort of perfect body discussion is like, why does God need a body? Okay, if he's all powerful, um, you know, bodies are kind of limited. I mean, it's he even. Certainly, I would think, would want to change it periodically. Yeah. He could go from one body to another body, you know, kind of morph himself into whatever he wanted. Yeah, but I mean, he's got pretty big biceps. I mean, he could probably, you know, curl four or five hundred pounds, mm -hmm. you know, like Arnold. Um, there's a photograph of Arnold curling five hundred pounds. Is that right? But I think what it was was they just loaded the bar on top of him and he dropped it down. <laughs> <laughs> Took the photograph as he was resisting it falling. But, uh, <laughs> but it is a 500 pound curl, uh, which is right impressive. So. Um, well, I could do that too if it wasn't so damn heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. But, uh, yeah. I don't know. You know, noticed, I, uh, you know, I'm 85 now and I've noticed that they've changed weights and measures because uh, what uh, used to weigh 50 pounds now weighs 100. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way that works. It's probably something about the metric system, John. Or, or, or um, the expansion of the universe. Some kind of a conspiracy. It's the expansion of the universe. That's it's what it is. It's making things heavier. Yeah, yes. must be. <laughs> I don't know. That's what it must is. Must be something. But uh, anyway, so I will open the lines for somebody else. Well, hold on. Okay. While you're on the line, John, let me ask you one more question. Okay. We're talking about man in the image of God, but the Catholic God um, is the, uh, it's not just Catholic, it's the whole Christian religion, I think, that has the Trinity, right? Yeah. You well, have well, not, not just... Not all of them. There's Unitarians. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's that's. And that's what the uni stands for. Exactly. No, it's just one God. Forget this Trinity nonsense. And does he have a, a body? Um, Depends uh, on if they discuss it. Yeah, right. On on so. a Sunday, but you have the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Right. Um, and that distinction is one I've never quite understood. I under, I'm, I'm told to believe that it was sort of an invention of the early Christian church in order to compensate for a lot of the polygamy that was popular at the time, but I don't know if that's well, a true statement. Well, you, got, you apparently didn't get the whole memo. Mm -mm, I mean, enough. which, is, which is, is to tell you that this is so confusing that you shouldn't talk about it or think about it anymore. Just don't worry your pretty little head Just about it. go back that. into the fields, work, you know, and pay your tithe to the church, mm -hmm. and don't worry about this because they took care of it. I see. Yeah, that... That's always been confusing to me, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Which when one is the one with the body? Uh, the only God. Yeah. And uh, if he never had a woman, how did he have a son? Yeah. And, oh, well, he, uh, just, he just used And I never woman. did understand what the Holy Ghost was supposed to be. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, it, it obviously is the least embodied of the three. Yeah. And so um, the, the Son, I assume that's Jesus Christ, and he had a body. Mm -hmm. um, and presumably that body ascended and never was cremated or rotted or anything like that. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just somebody seen him ascending to heaven. Yeah. And uh, he must still be gone because <laughs> must still we've reached be. out there billions of miles and we haven't found heaven yet. So. Of course, they'll be very small by this time. Have you ever gone up onto the Internet to look at, uh, there's a YouTuber called Dark Matter 2525? I never even heard of it. Okay. Well, he makes these uh, flash videos, which are 2D videos, and he's pretty good at it. He's been doing it for a long time. I don't know, he's got half a million subscribers at this point. But recently, his last video is the 10 reasons um, uh, why Jesus Christ has not done the second coming. And there's an interesting, one of the 10 reasons is because he hasn't gotten to heaven yet. Because mm -hmm. the universe is expanding, and... He's traveling at the speed of light, so he can never reach the end of the edge of the universe to get to heaven. Oh. So he's still, you know, the Jesus was, zombie yeah. is still floating in space trying to get to the edge of the universe and can never get there. That must be it. It must be, heaven must be outside the universe someplace. Now, well, it seems like a bit of a miscalculation, though, on God's part. Couldn't he do some kind of Holy Spirit thing and, and get that corrected? <laughs> I suppose God can do whatever God wants to do. <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, no, it's worth wa it's worth watching if you're connected to the internet, John. You should go up to YouTube and check out Dark Matter 2525. And I will look it if up you just do dark, if you just type Dark Matter, um, it, he'll he'll come to the top of the list. He's really a popular YouTuber, and uh, and his most recent is is the 10 reasons why Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, Jesus Christ has not yet happened. Well, and it's, it, was, it's quite good. I was told by a, a, a really dedicated uh, Christian that uh, the, uh, and this was back years, well, it, it was one of our higher hands when we were logging, said that, uh, that the, uh, the world, the, the, the uh, apocalypse was going to come in the year 2000 because uh, uh, somewhere in the Bible it says that somebody asked Jesus when he when it would be, and, and he said, "Well, it will last one thousand, but it will not last two. Mm. And I think that probably was why all the uh, rage was going on at the turn of the century when everybody thought that all hell was going to break loose, and, and it didn't. Mm. Uh, probably from that quote, although I personally never seen that in the Bible anywhere. But uh, you know, I, I probably read. 75 percent of the Bible, but uh, I haven't read it all. But uh, yeah. you know, it's just uh, I ended up reading it as a novel instead of a uh, a factual representation of history. Yeah, if so, you if you do read it, you know, kind of going through fast, it's it's pretty readable. But if you stop and try to outline the thing. And figure out what's going on, and, mm. and and take it all in. So and the rest of it, it's pretty tedious. But yeah, red is red is just sitting there, just cranking it out. Especially the more recent translations. Um, you know, the King James Bible is is pretty tough to make your way through. You know, on a straight reading. But the the newer translations, you know, they move along pretty well. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that uh, ancient history had all its uh, superheroes. So Christianity had to have uh, uh, Samson, yep. So they could compete. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, people, you know, I when I read those kind of things, I think, well, you know, we had to have one too because they had one, and uh, they they just don't realize that the uh, the whole thing is made up in order to uh, forward the idea that the the church should be controlling everybody and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, superheroes are handy in that regard. Yeah, <clears throat> and mythologies in general. Uh, you know, All the human idea cultures that it was have mythologies. Hair, you know, uh, is is a two two edged sword. There, it's, he believed it was in his hair, but the implication I get that he didn't get lose his power because his hair was cut. He lost his power because his faith in his hair that 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 was his uh, God giving that for his power. And, and he lost the hair, then he lost his faith, so then he lost his power. He lost his confidence because yeah. it was a yeah. placebo. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem with, with Samson and, and is the Samson story is the same as the problem with the Pharaoh story in Moses. I mean, we have the plagues, okay? So God keeps hardening Pharaoh's heart. So we have one plague, and then... God hardens his heart, and so we have another plague, and God hardens his heart, and we have another plague, and God hardens his heart, because God's not done showing off. The same problem happens with the Samson uh, story, because they keep trying to get him, and he keeps being stupid. Yeah. So it's like he's, he's got this problem with uh, Delilah, who's been trying to knock him off, and he, you know, he just doesn't, <laughs> instead of realizing that she's not good for him, you know, he keeps... He keeps doing yeah, what he, she wants. He was kind of a thick-headed guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he probably dropped out of school in kindergarten. <laughs> but he had faith. Yeah. yeah. That's what matters. Yep. So, yeah, actually, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dark Matter 2525 uh, did the entire Samson and, and Samson and Delilah story, or the whole Samson story. And it's, com it's complete. I mean, most people just, you know, talk about a little piece of it, but it really rambles on for a long time in the Bible. And so um, it's, uh, you know, it just goes on and on. And, and, and you see this guy just being stupid one time after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, un until, you know, 
until the end. It, it's just this guy being stupid over and over. Um, but most people, you know, just read a, a little, you know, I mean, if the, if the story is like this big, they're only reading this little piece of, of it. Um, the heroic part. The heroic part at the end, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they made a two and a half hour movie out of it. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, a lot there to make. Yep. I mean, it, the story is long enough to extend into that easily. So. Well, I'm going to have to get off here and let Sheila call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. So we'll talk okay. to you later. Bye bye. Talk to you later. Bye. So, so you've studied the Bible closely. Um, the uh, the manner in which Mary is impregnated with Jesus. Are there details there? Um, I would say no. I mean, it's just an angel appeared. An as angel I appears and says, "You're going to have this." And uh, he kind of just goes like this, and 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 then something. Well, I, I think it's sort of after the fact. Oh, it has been done already. Yeah, and the angel comes by and announces, you are with child, and it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she says, but that's impossible. Yep. And there was no, like, delivery of any components from the... It's been a long time since I, since I, I read that, that part of it, so I don't really remember the details all that well. You would think that the God, the Father, yeah. you know, in the image of man and all that sort of thing, that it would be a little bit more... Um, Natural. But it's all, I mean, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah. and it's only in I think one of them that you get. Oh, the, is that, that right? You get the story. Yeah. So I'd have to I'd have to go back and look at it, but I think it's only in one. So of them. So is the the mythology in the church is the the idea that the Father has been present at all times that that's the physical body of God and that the, He existed for all eternity from the very beginning, and He's the one that actually created the universe. Or that was it that spirit, God the Spirit? Because there was no son for oh, a long, we're talking long time. Oh, we're talking back the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, the question is, was there a Trinity before God did the That's creation? That's the question, yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I there don't couldn't know. have been the son part, right? I mean... We already know that story. <laughs> that was a long and complicated story. Well, how do we know that God didn't exist and just, you know, chip off a part of himself and throw it down into the sun? Right. Okay, so, um, you know, right, I, I, right. that's the impression that I had is that, um, that Jesus already existed and got inserted. And, uh, like a little homunculus? Yeah. And they because were, we're told that he was born as a baby. And grew up into a man, and so he can't just be an already existing man that's then just tossed yeah. down onto the but, earth. But he gets to be 12 years old, and he's in the temple teaching the rabbis. Yeah, so, so he's, he's um, precocious. So I buy that, you know, the son of God, he's precocious. Well, the, but the, the thing was that the argument is made that he's already all-knowing at that point. I see, okay. So. But he's also supposed to be experiencing life on earth. Right. Which includes ignorance. <laughs> Which is kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How can he be all-knowing and be able to actually experience the condition of man? Because if you didn't believe it, they stoned you to death. I see. Okay. Yeah. But he does, Jesus does talk about God being his father. Oh, uh, well, and makes a, makes a big deal out of that in the Gospels. Um, well, actually... Several times over and over. Actually, that's, there's a book by Bart Ehrman um, I think the title is How Jesus Became God. Oh, okay. And um, I did read it. There is a copy in the Eugene Public Library. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is, is uh, there's four Gospels that got canonized. There's a lot of them that didn't, mm -hmm. but there's four that did get canonized. And um, the order, they actually appear as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but the order in which they were written was Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. Okay. Okay. And so in Mark, uh, Jesus is totally a man. Okay. There's mm -hmm. no God about him at all. Okay. Okay. But by the time you get to John, he's like totally God right from the beginning. All right. You know, and he could, you know, he could just take his stick his hand out and do death ray stuff. Yeah. You know that guy. He's, he's like. Well, he totally talks a lot about the miracles. John does. Yes. He's but, totally powerful. Yeah. But the miracles are. Are you saying the miracles are a little more downplayed in, for example, Mark and Matthew? They don't exist. They don't exist at all. Yeah, none of that stuff. The loaves and the fish and the blind man with I'd the spit. I'd have to. Look, I'd have to go back and, and look wine. through look through this stuff again yeah. to, to see where these particular stories. But because those are very important in John. Yeah. The idea that Jesus performs these magic tricks mm -hmm. yeah. is supposed to be evidence for his yeah. divinity. Yeah. The, the, 
The thing that, that Airman recommends is that you take, okay, in other words, if you look at, at all the four stories, okay, yeah. there's some of them that have stuff that's unique to them. In other words, the story is only, a part of the story is only told once. And there's some of them where literally there is outright plagiarism. Right. In other words, you have these large tracks that are exactly the same wording. Mm. So it's, it's like, excuse me, uh, we have two possibilities. Either God, okay, love moved, that quote so much. Exactly, <laughs> moved the hands of the author to make yeah. sure that it got in there multiple times, or it was simply copied. Yeah. It, was, it was outright plagiarism. But you have that set of, you have that set of problems. But what Airman suggests is that what you need to do is to take the four books and set them next to each other. Mm -hmm. And then instead of reading one and then the next and the next and the next, read the same stories. In other words, start down through one until you get to a story that's, that's in number two okay. or in number three. Okay. And then compare the two stories. Yeah. In some cases, it's literally word for word. In other cases, there's huge differences in the stories. This is, this is where that list of 439 direct um, uh, contradictions comes in. Oh, okay. And you get a huge okay. amount of that going back and forth between the four Gospels because the accounts uh, in the Gospels uh, appear to have evolved. I see. So, well, surely that's been done by the people who go to seminaries, to a theological school. They actually do perform that action. Mm -hmm. Compare and contrast, and what are their answers to these contradictions? What what is their spin on this phenomenon? Well, it depends. If you're talking about people who stay in academia, they will talk about this. There we are. Okay. Hi, uh, you're on the air. What's your name? It's it's me again. <laughs> hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Bruce mentioned a while ago, just in kind of a, a quick passing, that uh, the uh, the blind man and the spit, mm -hmm. which brought up something to me that uh, that I've. Uh, thought about a lot, and that is that uh, it seems like all mirac miracles and uh, stuff require theatrics. And you don't just plain do a miracle. You've got to have theatrics. you got to spit in the mud, or spit in the, in the dust, make mud, put it in the guy's eye, and go tell him, wash his eyes out, and then he can see. Well, I go through all that to say, you can see, and have him see, you know. And it's just like the, uh, the uh, witch doctor throwing uh, gunpowder on the fire to make it flare up so he can cure some ailing uh, tribe member or something like that. And uh, all of the, almost all of these miracles require some theatrics to bring them off. Yep. And I have often wondered, if they're miracles, why do they need theatrics? Well, let's, let's go all the way back to um, Exodus and the miracles with um, uh, Moses coming in. So what does God give Moses first? He gives him this stick that when he throws it on the ground, it turns into a snake. Yeah, and then he that's can, cool. Then he can pick it up and it turns into a stick. Well, it turns out that, the Pharaoh, that Pharaoh's magicians could do that same trick. So they said, yeah, nah, you don't have any power here. Hmm. So, so Moses had to go back to God and say, excuse me, that's not a good enough I trick. I need a better trick. I need a better <laughs> trick. <laughs> exactly. And God said, hmm, let's see, pick a card, any card. <laughs> there again, it's, it's all theatrics. Yeah. And, uh, so you, you have to have theatrics to pull off any kind of miracle. You only know, use these staff to split the Red Sea. Yeah. And, uh, so God is not just in the image of man. He's in the image of con man. <laughs> he's a, he's a, an especially expert um, showbiz character. Yeah. It's, I don't know, you know, it's, if, if you look over time, I mean, the number of people believing this stuff is going down, okay, as a percentage of the population, and as people die off. Hmm. Um, you know, we had, for example, the civil rights movement, and I can remember 60 years, actually, I took six, turned 63 last week, so there. Congratulations. Um, but I can remember huge amounts of really overt racism mm. going yeah, around yeah, between, you know, fathers and uncles and my father's friends and all mm. the rest of this stuff. And it was pretty extreme. And what's happened is a lot of those people, when the civil rights movement happened, they just weren't going weren't gonna to change. And so they've been dying off. And so you look, you know, since the early 1960s, we've got 50 years, mm. a little, two and a half generations. Mm -hmm. And so... A lot of those people who um, held those particular beliefs have just died off. And 
we're going to, you know, in terms of, you know, gender stuff, the feminist movement, second wave feminism, um, you know, a lot of the sexism that went on, I can remember huge amounts of it as a child, uh, really overt. And those people, again, who hold those attitudes have died off. And now we have people who say, oh, yeah, women should be equal, which is a good thing. You know, that's how it should In be. In fact, you could make an argument, this is a little bit cynical, but not too cynical, um, that the only real political and social change that we've experienced in our lives is not the result of individual people changing, mm -hmm. but rather the slow, inevitable demographic of old people dying off and young people growing up in a slightly different culture. Yeah. The one thing that, that troubles me about the religion part is that um, corporate America, uh, starting with the Powell letter, decided that they needed religion in the society and they spent a lot of money to bring it back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Powell letter told, you know, business leaders to set aside their differences, pool a ton of money, and change how America thinks. Mm -hmm. And so, starting in 1971, <coughs> several billion dollars a year have been put to that cause. And the first place that money went was into the Christian right. And so they um, there was a resurgence of religiosity in the United States because it was seriously un, in the decline uh, during the early 60s but was brought back during the 70s and through the 80s. Um, so that I consider to be evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, So in other words, what's happened is a bunch of people, in order to gain a political, economic, and social advantage, invested a staggering amount of money to bring back a social evil. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but I can't see it any other way. <coughs> well, you know, that, that uh, you know, the concept that, uh, you know, you can make a law now, but you can't expect much results for at least a couple of generations. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be facing the same thing in the Middle East. I mean, you can go over there and, and set up your own type of government and everything, but the people aren't going to change their beliefs. They're, they're still going to uh, kill stone people, bury them up to their neck and stone them to death for a couple of generations until finally they, the younger ones that uh, are getting more educated as time goes along is going to say, you know, I just don't really buy that anymore. It just doesn't look reasonable to me. And that's how prejudice uh, uh, has uh, come to be less violent and stuff than it was like 50 or 100 years ago, mm -hmm. which uh, I still say boils down to the fact that when you do somebody a great wrong, it it makes you hate them, and uh, so yeah. they they just so we we did the uh, the Negro population so treated them so badly that we had to hate them in order to justify the way we treated them. Oh yeah, we had to dehumanize them. Yep. So, so. but looking say in the Middle East, okay, um, there used to be an empire, the Ottoman Empire which unfortunately for them uh, picked the wrong side during World War I and they got disassembled. Um, but they were maintaining Sharia law in that area. In other words, anyone who disagreed with them um, would be punished severely, as in stoned to death. Um, now the thing is that if you look at, at science in the Middle East, science in the Middle East uh, stayed alive until essentially the imams, the religious leaders in there, uh, kind of took over and shut down any level of skepticism. And that's when science ended uh, in the Middle East, where they no longer um, were the, the society that was doing plumbing, <laughs> indoor plumbing, or all kinds of other things, you know, uh, to improve the lives of the people who live there. In other words, that's what science does. It's like, oh, we got a problem, we figure out how to solve it, and then we, you know, we have an electric grid, or we have a communications grid, or we have a sewer Sewage. system, <laughs> you know? And, you know, we'll just dump it into the river until the river becomes really horrible, and then it's like, okay, well, we better clean up the river. And so we start building sewage treatment plants. And so what happened what happens is as long as you have the free exchange of ideas, uh, free speech, then this stuff works pretty well and science and technology advance the quality of life for the people. But once religion takes over, you're kind of locked in where you are. 
and it's maintained through again through violence where the the state and the religious leaders have a you know a pact and they proceed to maintain control well you know following the ottoman Emp the fall of the ottoman empire uh, you were getting the secularization of the middle east and that ended as uh, you know, starting in the 70s, we begin to see that fall apart because it's maintaining uh, an oppressive system um, for the power of the, the players in charge of it. And more people are revolting. Um, but again, you might look at the Shah of Iran as, a, as an example where, you know, it was sort of a secular society, but he's pretty repressive. And if you can't solve the problem, then the only group that gets organized around is religion. We saw the same thing in the United States for the civil rights movement. Uh, any attempt to organize blacks outside of a religious context was essentially stopped. And, um, and I would say that overall that the people who architectured the civil rights movement were fairly benign. I mean, they could have been much worse. Uh, we, it could have gone the direction that the Middle East went. Well, and, uh, in, in closing, I got a little interesting uh, concept that I have, and, and that is uh, something that uh, I've practiced and been aware of for years, and that is if you really hate somebody, you suffer more greatly than they do. Yep. Hating somebody doesn't change them a bit, but when you get around them and you get so agitated that you want to do something physical or something, you're damaging yourself. Absolutely. So hating somebody is, is, does more harm to you than them. But the, but the question comes down to how do you resolve the problem? So, I mean, I haven't come up with a, you know, you can either continue to fight them, you could take different strategies. I mean, there are passive aggressive strategies that work really well, where you are submissive, but at the same, at the same time subversive. And, you know, if you're willing to maintain that kind of stuff, you can, you can nuke them in the end. Um, which is, you know, I mean, a lot of diplomacy is about that kind of stuff, maintaining these sorts of strategies. You read The Art of War, you read, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things, uh, and they're telling you not, you know, that sometimes the subversive um, is your better way to win, especially against uh, forces that are considerably stronger than you are. If you can get your opponent to self-destruct internally, then you don't have to fight him. Well, my, my personal uh, way of dealing with it is, is to treat those people that have wronged me as uh, total strangers. Yeah, I, people I, like to them if you need to. Uh, don't spend any time with them you don't need to. And uh, just uh, treat them as if they were another stranger. Works for me. I, I find that just leaving, just terminating my relationship with the person uh, is the simplest thing to do. But of course, in some cases, there's a cost associated with that. Well, sometimes it, it's inner family, and then it's uh, kind of hard to do. Yes, you two can actually leave your family if it's oppressive <laughs> enough. So. Well, yeah, but the, the, by the same token, there's got to be members of your family you don't want to leave. That's true. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's the trouble with this whole family, tribal thing. other members of the family you do want to leave, yeah. but like I said, uh, my, my uh, 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 way of dealing with that is just to treat them like uh, polite, treat them politely, like any, you would any stranger. Yeah, but let's let's before you take get head off, let's let's talk about the original thing, which is um, the anthropomorphizing of God. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, human beings made in God's image. So, you know, God's, uh, you know, God's a bodybuilder with a white beard and, you know. And a temper. And a temper, yeah. And, um, and he carries grudges. Oh. He doesn't take your advice, John. <laughs> well, he should. Well, and you presume to, <laughs> to advise God? Sure. I, I suppose that's... Not. I suppose that's a, a, a better stance. I'm, you know, advising God as opposed to telling other people what God believes. Yeah. So, you know, that's the height of arrogance is, 
is claiming that uh, someone knows what uh, the all-powerful, all-knowing um, creator Not of the Not only know what he thinks, but he's spoken to me directly and mm -hmm. appointed me the policeman yep. that's going to enforce his law. Mm -hmm. And I'm better than you for that reason. That's, a, that's a quite a yeah, remarkable yeah. arrogance. Yeah. I find that strange that, uh, that some people actually talk to God, that, but uh, they, uh, they come out with these uh, outrageous demands on the human race because God talks to them and tells them what to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Of course, they also talk to God and tell God what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great deal of prayer is attempting to influence God not the other way around. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, and especially since God's got a plan. You know, as George Carlin talked about it, you know, God's got a plan, put a lot of thought into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, worked it all out, okay, and if now... Only we knew what it was. <laughs> and so, well, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're attempting to convince God to change his plan. Why should God change his plan for you? Well... I don't know. Or was it part of God's I, I, plan I that you I, had to pray? I, I think I know more more about the human race than he does. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty presumptive. I think there's yep. a lot of yep. little technical details well, that it's, it's, God it's leaves it's pretty easy to, to be uh, wiser than a uh, uh, make-believe entity. <laughs> that yeah, is, it, that's it, a good point. It's, it's pretty easy to be smarter than something that doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, okay. okay. I'm, I'm going to relinquish again. So. We'll, we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Bye. At least we have one loyal yes, uh, exactly. listener. And there, there, was a, there was a point that I was sort of making my way to, um, trying to remember where, where were we in the hmm. conversation. I don't know. I'm trying to remember, too. Yeah. We sort of we sort of get off these uh, this stuff, but I don't know God in the image of human beings. So you know, did it's God so remarkable <clears throat> to imagine that of all the different physical structures, that something as huge and immense as God is, yeah. that He'd choose a human body. Hi, you're on the show. What's your name? Sheila. Oh, welcome Hi, back, Sheila. Sheila. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Okay. So what's up? Um. Well, you've covered so many. You covered so many uh, points in such a little t uh, time. It reminds me of uh, how the rest of the world functions. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Um. Oh well, I probably shouldn't open this can of worms, but well, I will say. Or, yeah, open it anyway. Hey, hey, uh, you might have turned sixty-three last week. Last week I turned seventy. But, uh, and I'm a feminist, and I don't uh, hold any of the views that you say feminists hold that you're ranting about. Um, uh, another point would be what, what one thing w in the 60s, what women wanted, and maybe in the 20s when the right to vote was came up, but they wanted to be released from doing all the shit work, like motel maids and waitresses, and mm -hmm. there's probably just tons of things in my mind that I can think of. And... Um, and along that line, I'll say that men have to do shit work a lot, too, like plumbing and stuff, but they get paid much better for it than waitressing and cleaning mm. motel and hotel rooms yep, and people's point. houses and all that. Yep. So that's the point on feminism. Um, this, uh, and I have another thing that took place in physics. Would you say um, that a man, a human being, could fall from the 47th story building and survive and... and uh, be as healthy as uh, most of barking around like most of us do these days? Well, there are people who've survived very large falls. I mean, I, I, had, uh, I have a friend who has a machine shop in West Eugene, and uh, there's a guy working for a Mitch who actually fell at the edge of a roof on the fifth floor. He f fell through some rotten plywood and fell five flights and broke almost every bone in his body and survived. So, hmm. yeah, I saw Morgan Freeman interview him. You know, Morgan Freeman, the yeah. actor. Uh huh. Pretty, pretty, uh, uh, with a man with integrity, I think, for most of all I've seen of him. He interviewed a, a window washer that fell from the 47th floor yep. uh, in New York, and his brother was on the same scaffolding. And he, um, 
his brother was killed, and he survived following that 47 stories. Now, in physics, that would seem like pretty impossible to me. You know, I mean, and he's a healthy man today. So uh, physics... Um, well, the, the question is, what, did his, what broke his fall? Okay, if Nothing he broke his fall. Don't, don't start filling in details. Don't start your narrative. He <laughs> fell 40 <laughs> off a of scaffolding. He just fell 47 floors, floors and right. plopped on the pavement. But one of the things that we you see... You got it. Uh, uh, yeah. So one of, the th your name one of the things that we see... Okay. Bruce, you got it, Bruce. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's, just, let's just sort of use fictional examples. I mean, one of the things we see in movies is people falling high heights. But they usually let them land on something like a, a dumpster full of, uh, you know, plastic bags or something. Something that, you know, slows their fall a little bit. Or, or it's, it, you know, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the landing. And so the question is, if you can decelerate that landing, you can do pretty well. You know, people who, you know, jump off cliffs um, and land, you know, if there's this, like, thing of sand... I mean, I watched a guy... Yeah, okay, we know all those things. I was talking yeah. about real-life events. I also want to bring up one more point from your previous show where you Go said ahead. the building wasn't hot. I saw many films and interviews of people that uh, went through that uh, catastrophe, and one woman had, you know, she left her home, she went to come to work, and when she got to the front door, she put her hand on the metal door handle, and it, like, Fried off all the flesh on her hand on the that was on the ground floor. Yep. So the building was hot. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that needs to be looked at. How did we get the heat on the first floor? If you're talking ground floor, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, your story of the firemen getting up there and saying, "Oh, no big deal, just you a should, little you fire." Should, the you should go jumping out the windows. You also, on the very top floor was a restaurant, which probably had a lot of heavy equipment, you know, sta uh, stainless steel stoves and refrigerators those, and those freezers and all that stuff. There was heavy stuff throughout the building. Okay, a lot of computers, a lot of file computers cabinets. Computers don't weigh like a refrigerator weighs. A lot of refrigerators. A lot of refrigerators. A lot of soft drink machines. So, you know, enough to account for between 450,000 and 500,000 tons. So, yeah, it's a lot of, lot of, lot of big stuff on the, on, the, on the building. Yeah, yeah, there so. was. But again, um, the question is, if you, if you have a, an example like the thing that you talked about, somebody surviving a 47 floor, uh, floor fall, um, yeah. That's not the norm, but let's assume that it's true. So the question comes down, is there an explanation for it, or is it a miracle? And I would tend to think that there's probably an explanation for it. But I think it violates the laws of physics myself. I don't think there was any explanation that uh, well, how so? accounted for 47 stories. You just, 47 stories. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the woman burning the flesh off her hand at the... Door in the yeah, and probably so higher in the building, actually. But it depends where you are in relationship to the fires. So, you know, again, looking at the evidence itself, okay, mostly we have black smoke coming out of the buildings, which is the indication of an oxygen-starved fire. And is that true of, of all fires? I mean, there's all pretty much. certain materials burn in different ways. Is that true? Well, let's take a campfire. Yeah, I've been. A, I've had campfires. Go ahead. Okay. Now, if your materials, if you if you blow on the fire, okay, um, and you produce, you know, in other words, say you get a bellows and you squeeze on the fire, you're going to get less smoke because more of it will gasify. The actual an actual fire doesn't burn the wood. What it does is it heats up the volatiles that leave the wood, and then once it's a gas, is when the combustion occurs, and so. The issue is, if you can um, uh, get it hotter, you get a better release of the, the gaseous material, and it oxidizes better, and so you do get less smoke. So and you do know on a camp... Less, a different color of smoke. Well, yeah, but what happens is you, as you, get a, you start out with a fire, and it's not very hot yet, um, because it's just beginning, and you get a lot of smoke on it. And then, later on in the evening, 
uh, while you're sitting in front of the fire, you have this bed of coals and you keep putting things on it, you get a lot less smoke. So the hotter the fire, um, the less smoke you're going to get. And that's, you, can, you can test that with a campfire. So what does that have to do with black smoke? Well, black smoke means that it's not, it's not a hot fire. Oh, okay. okay. So in it's other not, words... Uh, jet fuel burning is not a hot fire, you're telling me? The issue about the jet fuel is we've we got a couple problems. I mean, there are people making an argument. Okay, I have not done the mathematics on this one, but there are people making an argument that the size of the fireballs... Uh, when the two planes hit, we actually have footage of the first plane hitting, and we have lots of footage of the second plane hitch, hitting, that the fireballs are too large for the amount of fuel that was on the planes. So in other words, if you go out and you take a, you know, a drum full of gasoline and you blow it up, um, how big a fireball you get, and then when you scale that and you look at the size of the fireball, <laughs> what happened, you know, if the fireball is too big, there's people making that argument, okay? Then what that means is that most of that fuel would have been consumed in the, fire, in the initial fireball itself. So it wasn't going to be around to burn stuff internally. So you're talking about roughly about 6,000 gallons of gasoline. And, you know, go back to the original videos, take a look at the size of the fireball that hits the building. And then think about the fact that the building, the floors in the building are 208 feet. It's two-thirds the size of a football field. Okay? And compare the size of the fireball to that area of land, and then consider the volume of it, and look at how big the fireball would be with about 6,000 gallons of fuel. And you have a problem with it. So the question is, if the fireball is too big to start with, which is a problem all by itself that needs an explanation, um, then most of that fuel would have been burned in the initial fireball. So, you know, a lot of it is the physical evidence. Now, we can talk about, you know, you can wander the discussion through a whole lot of other stuff, but the bottom line is someone has to explain to me where the energy came from that pulverized the concrete, because it's not present in the, there isn't enough of it in the gravitational potential energy. So all this other stuff, you know, so again, once you realize something like that, then what you have to do is to say, okay, where did the extra energy come from? Not from me. <laughs> okay. Nobody's accusing you, Sheila. <laughs> no, but nobody is. So we got, uh, we got 12 seconds, so you get the last word. Yeah. No, I just meant the energy I have. I have to expend these days for <laughs> all this stuff, and uh, yeah. I appreciate John mentioning me. I, I okay. John's a well, cool guy. We've got to go. We ran out of time. So right. talk to you next time. Bye-bye.